I was reading an article recently about one of the founders of AI. He was talking about how one of the breakthroughs in AI research came when they realized that intelligence is not so much what you know, it's how you learn. It reminded me of a comment that a John Fuhrer made one time, that an attitude of respect is a sign of intelligence. Because what does respect mean? It means that you're open to the possibility that there's something you don't know that you could learn, and you could benefit from learning it. And so you treat the people around you with respect. Because if you show them disrespect, they're not going to share their knowledge. Respect also applies not only to, to people, but also to what's happening in your experience. You want to pay careful attention to what you're doing. Because what is the Buddha's message? We're suffering because of our actions. It means we're doing something wrong. So we have to learn. What is it that we're doing wrong? We come into this world, we have certain desires that shape our sense of who we are, the world we live in. And when those desires are fairly well met, we tend to be very impervious to ideas that we can get better. But the Buddha points out that the way we talk, the way we think, the way we act, is causing suffering someplace. He wants us to be sensitive to that. This is one of the reasons why we train the mind in meditation, we bring it to stillness. I was reading something else recently where someone was saying, well, why would the Buddha want you to have your mind still when he wants you to de develop discernment? You have to think in order to gain discernment. Well, there is the discernment that comes from thinking, and it's an important part of learning. You learn something new and then you think about how it affects what you already felt you knew, what you might have to reorganize. But if it's just thinking about what you're observing, what you can observe on a normal level, there's a lot you're going to miss. There's so much that goes on in the mind that's subterranean. When we talk about the subconscious, it's not like a basement, a different place in the mind. Subconscious things are actions in the mind that come very quickly. We're barely aware of them, but they're there. The Buddha points out that there are intentions that we can be totally unalert to, as he says. And yet they still act as karma. They do shape our lives. So to see these things, we've got to get the mind quiet. There's an interesting passage in, I think it's Majjama 125, where the Buddha compares the training of a monk to the training of an elephant. And there are stages that the elephant goes through. And there are stages for the monk, i.e. any meditator. When the time comes to meditate, the Buddha says, okay, keep track of the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. He says the same formula for feelings, mind, mental qualities. And as it describes it, we're not just thinking, we are thinking, but we're also being aware of what's going on, watching what's going on, and things as basic as the breath or the elements of the body. And when he describes about how to be aware of feelings, mind states, mental qualities, he says elsewhere that you do that while you're still anchored in the breath. So you want to be in the present moment, to watch these things as they're happening. And the breath is a good way to make sure that you're anchored here. Then when you can do that, he says, the next step in the training is to keep track of the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. But don't think any thoughts about the body. Same with feelings, mind states, mental qualities. So you're aware of the body, you're aware of the breath. 
but there's no thinking going on. Just holding this in mind. And there he says, you're entering the second jhana. The implication there being that when you're doing the basic steps in right mindfulness, you're starting in the first jhana, where you are thinking about the breath, thinking about your mind being with the breath, thinking about the feelings that are associated with the act of paying attention to the breath. So you're watching. You're not just thinking. You're watching what's going on. And then you get the mind really, really still. As he says, there are two ways you can develop discernment doing that. One is when you get really still, and you get really good at staying still. You can start observing the still mind. To see that it, too, is made out of aggregates. And it, too, is subject to inconstancy, stress, not self. So even in the still mind, you can observe. Or you can observe it as it goes from one state of concentration to the next, and you see what gets dropped. You're peeling away things in the processes of how you put things together in the present moment. And you can't see that unless you get really, really still. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha says you have to have respect for concentration. Because it allows you to see things you may not have seen before. And the things that used to be subconscious that were very quick and just barely there, a whisper in the mind, suddenly get very clear. It's like having your basement full of water. You find a way of draining it out. All the things that were hidden in the water show themselves as the water goes down. So be ready to learn a lot of things as you meditate. And we learn not only by thinking, but also by watching. And we watch most clearly when we get the mind really, really still. The other day someone came to visit and said his problem was he could get the mind really still, but he didn't seem to be going anywhere. Of course, the question is where are you trying to go? You want to learn about the mind by keeping it still. If the mind starts getting unstill, okay, where does it go? What does it latch on to? You can take that as your theme for thought. And the stillness is not something you want to do only while you're sitting or meditating. The Buddha talks about going through the day, exercising sense restraint. But at the same time, having mindfulness immersed in the body. So you want to be with your breath as you go through the day. This, he says, is your post. The analogies of six animals that correspond to the six senses. You have them on leashes, and you tie the leashes together. But if you don't have a post to tie the leashes to, the animals will pull and pull and pull in their different directions. The crocodile wants to go down into the river, the bird wants to fly up into a tree, the dog wants to go into the village, the jackal wants to go into a charnel ground, the snake wants to go into a hole. So they pull. It's probably the crocodile that's going to drag everybody down into the river because it's stronger. That's where they all die. But you have a post, he says. You tie the leashes to the post, and as much as they pull, pull as they might, they're not going to go very far. They end up lying down right next to the pole. Same way if you have the, the sense of stillness inside that you can carry around, and you keep your senses under control. And you can see where they're pulling, but you don't have to go along with the pole, because otherwise you get pulled to the river and you drown too. to have some respect for your concentration. Have respect for the concentration of others. 
Because you learn. You allow them to learn. This is how, as we live together, it's not a hindrance to the practice, it becomes an aid. As we respect one another, as we respect watching what's going on in our own minds, have that willingness to learn. That's how you show your intelligence. 